yeah, we can make a start. Um, yeah, so I mean, thanks for for the people that could come along. Um, so we, yeah, we're joined by Pack Bio and Millennium Science. So James Miller from um, Pack Bio and Paul Gooden from um, Millennium Science, and we're just going to have a discussion about their new Pack Bio Revio instrument that came out towards the end of last year, and um, with the aim that you know, trying to get um, maybe one installed here at QUT. But obviously, the users are going to drive what instrumentation we get in house. So it's just an opportunity to learn about what their system can do and how it might be helpful for for your research. So I'll hand you over now to, to Paul. To okay, I'll, I'll just start off for a, for a little bit. I'll say a huge thank you to to Karen, who's a marketing leader at Millennium Science, just for setting all this up. So thanks as always, Karen, uh, for making it smooth for us. Um, also on the call from from Millennium Science is is Stephen Hussey. Um, so um, Stephen and I are sort of um, um, directly um, running the the Pack Bio portfolio through Millennium Science. We distribute uh, Pack Bio and a number of other companies in Australia, and New Zealand. So that's um, our job. But um, we're also very lucky to have um, uh, somebody from Pack Bio in Australia, and that's James Miller. So um, I think he's going to start off um, giving a little bit of a of an overview of the stuff of of the nation as, as it were when it comes to the the pack bio company so um i'll i'll, uh, I'll leave you in the very capable hands of, of james for now and then i'll come back online a, a little bit later and and, uh, and and maybe present some stuff too um but obviously you know put in the questions as appropriately i think james is probably um happy if if um, people ask questions you know during the talk is that okay james rather than saving everything to the end yeah, and I'll, I'll pause. It. I've got a few things to talk about in terms of um, what's new, where we're at, and I can maybe pause after each section. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Over to you. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, Kevin, can you see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yep, yep, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just give you, a, I guess, a tour de force of where PacBio is at now. We're a very sort of different com uh, company than what we were two years ago and a lot has happened in the last couple of years in terms of our technology and what we're doing um, so I thought it'd be useful to to review that and I've got a quite a number of slides here um, and so I thought I'd talk take maybe 40 minutes to do that um, maybe a bit less if I depending on how many questions we've got to give you a, an idea of what we're doing at PacBio where the applications are and what's I guess what's driving our technology um, so our um, let me hide that. Our, our, our mission now at PacBio is to enable the promise of genomics to better human health, something that we sort of um, uh, took a lot of time working out uh, earlier last year. Um, there is a big sort of drive for us really to be involved in human genomics, but bettering human health is not just human genomics, it's also plant ag genomics, environmental genomics. So it's um, so that statement really in, is in the widest sort of definition uh, of, of, of bettering human health. Uh, and we really do create some of the world's most advanced sequencing technologies. Um, PacBio long read sequencing has come a long way. Uh, even the system that is at QUT now is not really able to produce any of the type of data that everyone is uh, using with PacBio and, and what we have shifted to, which is uh, hi-fi sequencing. And so hi-fi sequencing really has been um, it really has been quite a game changer in the in the field of genomics and particularly for PacBio. Um, and what hi-fi sequencing is, I know that many of you, I'm sure, are aware of, of, of what hi-fi sequencing is, but just as, as a review, um, we start with double-stranded DNA. We uh, ligate um, uh, what we call smart bell uh, uh, adapters, these, these loop adapters onto the ends of a molecule of DNA. And then we bind a polymerase molecule to it and we sequence an individual molecule of DNA in the sequencing elements that we call ZMWs in our consumables. And we generate um, data from, uh, from this of nucleotides that we incorporate into the DNA strand as the polymerase moves along the DNA strand. Um, and that's how PAC biosequencing, I guess, has worked um, for, for many years now. Um, but where we are now at the state where our, our read links, our raw read links are so long that we can sequence uh, multiple passes across this molecule. We can um, 
generate sequence across one strand and then go around the loop and generate a sequence off the opposing strand of the complementary strand and then just keep going around in a circle and that that produces many passes of of um across this or across the same molecule um, and we're able to take all of that data and produce a consensus read or a consensus sequence from all of the passes of that one molecule to produce a highly accurate read um, now the fundamental sort of error profile of PacBio is completely random. And so what that allows us to do is to produce um, you know, a highly accurate read that doesn't have any, any bias and it's free from um, systematic, uh, any types of systematic errors. And that's and these, this, high, this type of HiFi data is something that QUT can't currently do on their SQL system. Uh, and it was only really enabled on the SQL 2 system and subsequently now uh, the, the Rebio system. But all of our sequencing, all of our applications are now driven by HiFi uh, hi fi reads, HiFi sequencing. Um, and there's many applications where HiFi sequencing is, is really proving to be um, game changing. So that's our sequencing technology. Um, and how does it compare to other technologies? So as you can see here in the green, PacBio HiFi has on an, on the median is Q30, so 99.9% .9 accurate sequence data of our HiFi sequence data compared to even more accurate than Illumina, slightly more accurate than Illumina data in the orange and significantly more accurate than ONT, um, which has a sort of a mode of or, or mean of, of of Q20 sequencing. So we 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 do have an extraordinary accuracy with PacBio HiFi sequencing, and most of our data actually. The majority of the data is actually beyond Q30, approaching in, in many instances, we're talking now about Q40 plus. So our customers have generated heaps of data with, um, with PacBio, in particular, all of, all of the recent data, as I mentioned, is PacBio HiFi. There's now many publications or publications coming out. It's just incredible how many publications have been coming out recently, and it's just exponentially growing. Uh, the, the publications that come out. We monitor them and I pick up the, the I guess, the, the most relevant high impact ones and uh, some of the latest data that's coming out, I'm gonna show you in the subsequent slides coming coming through. So PacBio today, all of that, all of this high fi is really driving um, PacBio's growth. Um, we now are a much larger company than we were even two years ago. Um, we've obviously got myself on the ground in Australia, but even our APAC team is about four times like it was a couple of years ago and our whole company's R&D commercial side, um, uh, many more people in the company now than there was a couple of years ago. Uh, and importantly, we have some really significant customer collaborations and partnerships across the plant and animal space with Earth Biogenome, um, uh, vertebrate genome projects, um, or all of all of the major um, uh, genome sequencing projects are incorporating PacBio HiFi now. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with Corteva as well in the agri-science um, uh, side of things, and they're using PacBio HiFi heavily. Uh, in the human genomic space, we're partnering with all of the major re research institutes around the world, particularly uh, for whole human genome sequencing for rare inherited disease, as well as population genomics, um, and, and we're um, we are collaborating and, 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 and building networks amongst those uh, or supporting networks amongst those different institutions to really build better resources for genomics in the long read sequencing space. Um, last year was a major year for PacBio. We had some major um, uh, innovations and new products coming out, improvements in our hi-fi and, and the usability, making libraries and sequencing. Um, we launched methylation calling on instruments, so 5MC on instrument. Um, and we also brought out some, some, some nice new workflows. We uh, brought out, um, uh, we had a partner, our, our partnership with Twist brought out sequencing, targeted sequencing panels. And we also brought out a target uh, tandem repeat genotyping tool. Uh, and importantly, towards the end of last year, two major innovations. Uh, one was the high throughput Revio that came, came out, as well as the other major innovation was this MassSeq kitted solution, which I'll talk about in the, in the next slides to increase the throughput of transcriptomics. So um, as I mentioned, you know, Paul, Paul, after I talk, Paul's gonna sort of unpack a bit more about what about Revio, what its capabilities are, and a little bit more in detail about what it actually delivers. Um, but it is um, delivering, um, Hi-Fi sequencing at scale, about 10 to 15 times the throughput of the SQL 2E system. Um, 
and being able to sequence about 1300 human genomes uh, in a year. So, and, and bringing the price of that down to a really affordable price point. Um, we also are partnering with many other, um, uh, many other commercial companies and create, creating a, I guess, a, 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 an ecosystem um, of PAC biocompatible uh, partners. So we're partnering with automation companies, um, uh, um, data analysis companies, compute companies, uh, as well as um, uh, Google Health, we have a collaboration with, uh, as well as targeted sequencing um, and, 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 and companies that are involved, I guess, or, or have solutions in the work code space, uh, be it um, Jump Code, Diagenode, or um, Miraculous. So we really, we really are ready to partner, collaborate, and really push the technology now with the resources that we have at hand. So there has been a... Um, a, uh, 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 so, so HiFi really is driving a number of paradigm shifts in um, in genomics, and I'm just going to go through, I guess, uh, the major sort of paradigm shifts. Really, where HiFi is um, is making some uh, is providing some significant value and benefit. So, the first one I want to draw attention to is the human genome, and the human genome uh, was actually only completed for the first time earlier last year. There was about eight percent of the human genome missing. Um, and I'm sure many of you are aware that, uh, that, that, that the complete human genome was published earlier last year, which covered the 8% that was missing, which are these, these red spots um, uh, in this graphic here. I, th I, heard a, I heard a beep. Can you guys still hear me, Kevin? Am I still on? I've got you, James. It's fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so the fundamental um, assembly, which was this CH, CHM13 assembly, is a string graph built directly from HiFi Read. So that human genome sequence was all um, uh, PacBio HiFi. Uh, there were some other technologies, scaffolding technologies, including uh, ultra long ONT reads that were incorporated to to um, to determine the determine the I guess the the path through the graph in very difficult parts of the genome. But that was just a manual curation effort of a small number of spots in the human genome. Uh, where there was still some uh, ambiguity about how to go through that string graph, but the primary assembly that all of the sequencing is packed by a high fire on that um, on that uh, human genome sample. Now, sub subsequent to that, um, the pan the human pan genome consortium have sequenced many genomes uh, now about uh, nearly fifty genomes initially in their initial publication, where. Um, uh, we're trying to build a pan genome to understand variation across the human genome. And some of the key outcome from that is really the realization that the human genome is now six gigabases in size rather than three gigabases in size. So the, st the, standard, the, the standard now in human genome assembly, and in fact, this is permeating through all genome assemblies, is to be able to do haplotype resolved assemblies, understanding how the different copies of the chromosomes um, the variation among them and, and what that means and in in, in, in I guess the, uh, um, in the in the biology behind it. So, um, and this effort really also was a technology comparison as well. They used multiple different technologies and essentially decided that PacBio HiFi was the way to go, giving the, the most complete, accurate assemblies with the least number of errors and being able to do haplotype resolved diploid assemblies. And so that effort is ongoing now and more genomes will be added to it as we get as we go forward um, so some of the nice things about this out of this pan human pan genome effort is that um uh, is that they're able to resolve a lot of the segmental duplications um, they are able to extend variant calling into an additional 120 megabases of um, segmental duplications uh, in the human genome which have never really been able to properly be analyzed before with short read technology uh, so that was a, a huge boon for, um, I guess, an outcome of this pan genome effort. Um, another example here is is from these um, high fire genome samples. Um, is that is that when you look at um, association studies, you realise that actually when you have haplotype resolved genomes and you have um, high accuracy genomes with comprehensive variant calling across the whole genome, including structural variants, indels, and SNVs, um, you can get actually more, um, uh, you can get better signals from your GWAS experiment with just a small number of HiFi samples as compared to 500 NGS samples. So this is a GWAS study um, from the African cohort that was within the human um, pan genome set, 
So just looking at uh, 23 samples and comparing how good the GWAS signal was uh, when you compared that to 500 short read sequencing samples. Um, so this MHC region was implicated in this, this particular um, uh, GWAS that they were, they were looking at. Um, and um, these some of the signals within the, the 500 NGS samples weren't even apparent in the um, uh, uh, or, or the signals that you got in the, from the 23 samples weren't even apparent in the 500 sample set. So, so now there's this thinking, okay, well, is it maybe it's more valuable to actually, when you've got this high accuracy data and uh, comprehensive genomes, to use smaller um, sample sets in your GWAS experiments and get a better result. Um, another example that came out of the human pan genome was, uh, was, was the characterization of the IGH region, a region that's typically extremely hard to characterize. Um, and using PAC biosequencing, HIFI sequencing, they're able to really generate the first comprehensive study of IGH polymorphisms across the genome. Uh, something that, that, you know, you would think that, you know, this is a pretty important region when it comes to immunology and disease, um, and it hadn't really been characterized properly before this study. Um, another key finding, I, I guess, uh, or in terms of human genome sequencing, um, I just want to draw your attention to, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware that that the All of Us initiative in the US is seeking to sequence uh, tens of thousands of genomes to understand variation in the human genome across lots of different ethnicities. Um, they just recently um, published uh, a preprint of their initial findings where, which and again, it was a technology comparison of, okay, how should we go about um, understanding variation across the human genome? Um, and they compared uh, variant calling in HAPMAT samples across multiple different technologies. And really the conclusion out of that study was that HIFI data achieved the best F scores um, and the best structural variant calling compared to either of the other major technologies they tested being ONT and Illumina. Um, and they were also able to analyze 386 challenging medical, medically relevant genes, genes like pseudogenes or, or genes that have low complexity regions where short read sequencing just falls down in those regions. Um, and they concluded that HiFi outperformed um, the other technologies in both precision and recall. So they're, they're, they're now going to go ahead and sequence um, many thousands of samples with, um, with HiFi to add to the, the database of genomic variants across um, a wide range of different ethnicities. Really, the, conc the conclusion they came to is we should continue to uh, developing population cohorts sequencing with long reads only. So now this is paradigm shift really where people are thinking, um, the, main, the, the key, key opinion leading researchers in human genomics are thinking, let's just drop short read sequencing together, uh, all together and just sequence with long read sequencing because it's delivering us so much better complete information um, and HIFI is outperforming in all categories for the long read sequencing. Um, so, so really uh, an, another fundamental paradigm shift, which I've already touched on, is that PacBio and HIFI is putting the W back in whole genome sequencing. Um, with short reads, um, essentially you just get SNVs and indels primarily, um, can do some structural variants, I guess, and, 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 and touch on some of these other things, but really um, highly accurate long read sequencing gives you everything. It gives you structural variants, tandem repeats, dark regions, phasing, and also, as I'll talk about later, uh, methylation as well, directly calling methylation from the sequence data. Um, so with that whole, whole putting the W back in whole genome sequencing, we're now working with many different research institutes around the world um, and applying HIFI sequencing to rare inherited disease and disease diagnostics because uh, now, you know, with one technology and doing whole genome sequencing, you can get all of this information, which previously might have required multiple different types of assays to uh, look at structural variants or tandem repeats or um, copy number variants, et cetera, lots of different assays in the lab, but you can get it all now with HIFI. So now the thinking is um, to apply HIFI in rare inherited disease. And there's many, um, uh, many different research institutes that are working on this now using uh, deploying HIFI in rare inherited disease diagnostics. Um, some of the first was Children's Mercy Kansas City Hospital. Um, was probably one of the first that we start working started working with, but this is ne this effort's now expanded out to a number of different other uh, other groups as well. Uh, and and some of these population genomics efforts are also linking into the rare inherited disease space to give outcomes from the the, the large scale sequencing efforts. Um, we have a workflow for whole genome sequencing data analysis, taking HiFi reads. You essentially um, have two different uh, analysis pathways. Uh, first one is a variant calling, so alignment 
and variant calling and calling SNVs, indels, and SVs uh, from the uh, the from the HiFi sequence data. And the uh, other side of the pipeline essentially is to do a de novo assembly de novo assembly using assembly algorithm with the HiFi sequencing data, and 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 that gets you complex rearrangements that can really only be resolved by doing a de novo genome assembly. Mm -hmm. So this is the sort of uh, thinking and the pathways that people are approaching uh, using HiFi sequencing data. And, and these, these, these bioinformatics workflows now are actually really quite efficient when you're using highly accurate HiFi data. For example, a de novo assemblies only on a, on a reasonable compute is only gonna take about a couple of hours to do that. So and, you know, to do all of this bioinformatics, uh, it's really only taking you a day to get down to the visualization and interpretation of uh, candidate variants, which might be driving rare inherited disease. I've got heaps of different examples to show you, things like poly A expansions or uh, being able to um, uh, phase variants across long regions um, or um, complex rearrangements that um, where, where um, uh, there's been some really nice results. Um, and as I said, Kansas City, um, hospital is one of the first to do that but but one of the other things that we're thinking about is that is that um you can get a structural variance um and and and, and rearrangements with this hi-fi data um but what is what's pathogenic and non-pathogenic so this is a question that needs to be resolved and 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 so a lot of these groups now they haven't a, a whole lot of hi-fi data are thinking well how do we how do we really expand on that? How do we understand the, the new variants that we're seeing that we're able to see in the other 8% of the genome and, and, and the regions that short read sequencing can't get at? Um, and so what, we're now working on a couple of initiatives. First is a consortium for long read sequencing, a frequencing database to understand what are um, more frequent uh, structural variants and expansions, um, what's pathogenic and non-pathogenic and, and really understand variation properly across the whole human genome. And so there's a, a, um, a consortium now called Colors DB that uh, we are part of and we're helping, um, helping our major customers sort of organize that database and work out um, benchmark pipelines and, 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 and help release that data to the wider, wider community. Um, the second initiative is the International Children's Hospital Consortium and Rare Inherited Disease. Uh, really, there's a, a need for more evidence from larger studies and, and in particular, putting together practical best practices. So the best practices in terms of pipelines and, um, and, and identifying variants and coming up with a, a list of variants and comparing that to the database um, and, um, and, and really sort of providing a clinical benchmark sort of um, uh, uh, workflow for how you analyze our data and helping customers uh, use our technology to the best the best they can in, in these sorts of rare inherited disease initiatives. So there are two major collaborations that we're involved in, um, and, I, and I'm sure over the course of the next year, uh, we'll, we'll make some really great progress in that. Um, another thing I just want to draw your attention to is that we last year we released a tandem repeat genotyping tool. So it's a whole genome sequencing tool where you can look at um, repeat expansions across the whole genome um, and have uh, highly accurate data across Re expansion repeats calling uh, deletions and insertions within those repeats and what the expansion is and being able to visualize that something that's been really actually quite challenging with expansion repeats as you can as you can imagine so we're able to do that now with hi-fi data and we've got a nice tool for that which was released um second half of last year um so so with that um i was going to move on to uh methylation and what we're doing in this in the space of being able to call um, methylation um, 5-methyl-C straight out of the box. Um, so midway through last year, um, uh, and, and calling 5-MC has, has in the past been challenging for HiFi, um, but now with Hi, uh, sorry, been challenging for PacBio, but now with HiFi, we've actually um, incorporated 5-MC calling straight out of the box um, uh, for all of the data that comes off uh, HiFi data. Um, so the way that the way that we do that is that we use a we use what we call the kinetic signal or base incorporation, and I'm, so I'm sure many of you are aware of how we actually call um, uh, DNA modifications 
But essentially, uh, we get kinetic data, so data over time of base incorporation as bases are incorporated into the into the DNA strand by the polymerase molecule. It generates a fluorescence. We detect that fluorescence, and then the next base gets gets loaded, and we detect that. Now, it just so happens that when you get a, a DNA modification or a methylation um, on the on the nucleotide, oh, sorry, on the DNA strand, it tends to change the rate at which the bases are incorporated. So you can see here for um, uh, for, for for a methyl A. Uh, there's actually a, a longer time of incorporation until the next base compared to if it's a non-methylated A. Um, and so we can use this signature, as we call it, and different types of DNA modifications have different signatures. We can use this signature to call whether there's a methylation present on this base or not, and, and we can just output that directly in the data. Now, um, 5MC was a tricky one because it had a sort of a subtle um, subtle kinetic signature, was, which was tricky for PacBio to, 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 to call from the kinetics. But in the same way that we get multiple observations of sequence data to produce a highly accurate hi-fi read, so multiple ob observations of the sequence gives, a, gives us our hi-fi data, we get also now multiple observ observations of the kinetics. So we see the kinetics signal across the same strand multiple times. And that's what's been able, that's what's enabled us to do accurate 5MC calling straight off secret, straight off, um, uh, straight off the system. Um, so we've now actually incorporated that directly into the informatics or the, the compute on the actual um, system. So the SQL 2E system and the Revio now just call 5MC straight out of the box. Um, and that 5MC data, you get it, essentially get it for free. There's no extra work, uh, work, work steps. Um, it's on instrument um, processing in, in minutes. It takes um, no, really no extra time to produce that data. Um, it has pretty much no extra uh, data footprint and it's in a standardized data representation. So you can just directly, it has BAM tags supported in IGV and you can directly vis visualize your methylation data directly in IGV. Uh, there's no extra calling required or um uh, to produce that 5mc data which is which is really quite quite nice so you're essentially getting 5mc data now um for free when you do whole genome sequencing um so what does it look like uh, so here's an example of a um, human genome uh, sample where you've got um, this gene uh, pg3 uh, with your hi-fi reads and you've got um uh, haplotype resolved um um uh, haplotype resolved data here we have haplotype one and two is showing this uh, uh, the variance there and then you can just turn on essentially turn on the 5mc and you essentially here you're seeing haplotype resolved 5mc data directly overlaid on the sequence data from that's coming out of either the Revio or um, the SQL 2e and you can see here you've got uh, blue is um, is um, uh, hypomethylation uh, areas and red uh, hypermethylation. So your methylation signal is is in is in red, and you can see this region here is methylated on one allele but non-methylated on the other, um, which is another really interesting um, thing when you're using long reads that you can now phase methylation across long region long regions and understand the the, the methylation in phase. Um, so we're starting to think of you know really interesting things like um, if you've got a uh, a really homozygous a region of a genome, um, can you now use methylation to be able to phase that region of the genome? So th these are the sorts of things that you know, we're starting to think, you know, people haven't really explored everything you can do with this 5MC data. Um, so here's a really interesting one, this myotonic dystrophy um, uh, case where you've got this DMPK repeat expansion. Uh, and this was um, uh, out, of, out of some of the rare inherited disease uh, samples in, in the US where they showed that this structural variant here um, was actually uh, potentially driving the methylation status of a region next to that structural variant, which was which potentially was um, important in the in the biology. Um, so really interesting stuff coming out of the 5MC. Um, and then and then also, again, in this large cohort uh, methylation study, uh, another study where they looked at 276 samples, um, and, and look for associations of methylation with structural variants uh, and SNVs. They found uh, a 69 base pair deletion, which had been missed before, which was linked to a hypermethyl hypermethylated uh, region, uh, which now they're sort of following up and trying to uh, see how that is linked to a, this particular um, rare disease that they were studying, um, which uh, in the in the DIP2B to, to, um, gene, which is, um, uh, which is a gene that 
uh, where some variants in that can cause global developmental delay. So some really interesting stuff coming, uh, coming out now with the 5MC data. Um, and expanding on that actually, uh, and this is something that uh, there's, there's probably a dozen labs now in the world that are doing this, um, uh, expanding on the fact that we can detect the, meth detect the kinetics of, um, of um, or, or the kinetics allows us to, to detect um, methylated bases. Um, there's a really smart group here that developed a new assay where they've taken um, chromatin bound DNA and actually done a transferase where they actually um, uh, uh, convert all of the A bases to methylated, um, methylated A bases. So the open regions of chromatin, um, they've actually converted all of the A bases to a methyl A base. So not 5MC, but the, the, they're now looking at the A bases and just converting the A bases to methyl A's in the open chromatin regions. And you, and you create these fingerprints of um, methylated A bases in open chromatin regions such that when you sequence that on our sequencer, you get these signals where methylated A bases, um, you can infer that they were, that was an open chromatin region um, uh, when you in, in the DNA before you prep the sample. And you're essentially showing, um, uh, it's essentially a way of doing a, uh, an attack-like assay just from directly sequencing whole genomes, uh, doing whole genome sequencing. So now uh, our intention probably is to commercialize this at some point. Um, um, but we ha and, and we're sort of talking about that, but there's about a dozen labs doing this around the world. So now from your one technology, one sequencing technology, you get all of your structural variants, all of your indels, all of your SNVs, all of your 5MC. And if you run this assay, you also get um, uh, an analysis of open chromatin regions in the same way that you would do an attack-based assay. So we're now talking about true multi-omics from a single technology. And, and, and this is this is something that's going to be, I'm sure, be used in many more labs in the future. So I want to touch on targeted sequencing as well. Um, so we do have some targeted sequencing approaches that you can use with, um, or, or that HiFi is amenable to. And we've done a lot of work um, in, in terms of our partnership with Twist, as well as in-house um, uh, building out resources for people to develop target, targeted sequencing assays. So there's really two um, main approaches for targeted sequencing for um, HiFi. One is uh, amplicons. So you can do a full length sequencing of PCR amplicons um, and, and get um, you know, highly accurate sequence from your PCR amplicons. It's low cost. Um, we've got lots of barcoding strategies for that. And this is useful for either looking at single genes or small panels. Um, so genes that um, like, um, um, SMN1, for example, in humans, or uh, or even 16S, really, in, in, in metagenomics, you know, your HiFi amplicon sequencing strategy allows you to then to sequence um, uh, uh, long amplicons at high accuracy. The other approach is with targeted in, uh, target enrichment. And so this is where we partnered with Trip, Twist, and we uh, have now have a supported protocol end-to-end -end solution with upfront um, pulling down of, uh, of, of regions of interest using biotinylated probes and pulling down five to seven KB fragments uh, from your sample and then uh, making a, 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 a smart bell library from that and then sequencing it. So there's, there's a number of, um, so, so this is useful for say larger panels, 50 genes plus, um, or you can use uh, small channels, as, uh, small panels as well. And so we've got a number of customers that are designing panels to go after, to you know, obviously reduce the cost of sequencing, be able to do more samples and do it in a, in a targeted fashion because you may only be interested in a number of different genes. So a couple of examples of this, um, and, and this is, the, the, the uh, I guess, the workflow. A couple of examples of this is the um, uh, where, where we have actually off the shelf or, or what we call alliance panels or twist has alliance panels is this dark uh, genes panel. So this panel um, is one that you can get from Twist now. Actually, it's a 22 megabase panel and it covers uh, 389 challenging medically relevant genes. These are um, the genes that are sort of termed NGS dead zone genes. They're difficult to sequence or map with short reads. So um, with whole genome sequencing or exome sequencing, the, the usual strategy is just to ignore these genes, which um, is not probably arguably not the best strategy considering they are uh, medically known to be medically relevant. Um, so there's many, these are, these are the sorts of genes where other assays in the lab need to be developed if you, uh, if, uh, rather than um, short read sequencing because short read sequencing just can't get at them. 
So intention, our intention behind this panel really was to give people a tool to be able to get at all of these um, challenging medically relevant genes and do that in an efficient, uh, cost-effective uh, uh, approach. Um, this is developed by this panel has actually been developed in collaboration between Baylor and Twist and PacBio, and as I said, you can actually order it now from their alliance set. Um, another panel that uh, has come out from Stanford um, is, uh, a again, a collaboration is on the uh, pharmacogenomics panel, uh, which has about 50 different genes on it, uh, all genes that are really tricky to sequence or mostly tricky to sequence with short reads, uh, but also um, important to understand the haplotyping and phasing of those genes as well, which, of course, um, you can do with uh, long reads. So this is a two megabase um, target region, and it has about 50 genes on it. Um, and, and as I said, it allows you to do to do uh, phasing. Um, so there's just a couple of examples, and of course you can um, you can design your own panel. Um, um, and and uh, we have a, a I guess a, a custom uh, workflow where you can work with Twist. They'll, they'll give them a genes uh, a gene list. They'll design your panel, and then you can just plug straight into our wet lab workflow. Yeah, how are we going for time? I thought maybe maybe I'll stop because I've, I've been talking a lot and um, uh, I've pretty much gone through whole genome sequencing in humans as well as targeted sequencing. And the next thing I was going to talk about was transcriptomics, but um, just wondering if there's any questions at this point. Does anyone want to ask a question now? Yeah. Got Peter Waterhouse. Uh, uh, hi, James. Um, hey, so, hi. Um, I don't, are you telling us that that we can do methylation sequencing for plant DNA? Because in the early days, they would say, oh, yeah, it's wonderful. We can get methylation sequencing of human genomes. And then we said, oh, well, here's our plant stuff. DNA is DNA. And then got told, well, actually, forget it. It won't. That doesn't work on plant DNA because plant DNA is somehow different. Is, is plant DNA still different? Or do you say that you're with the latest improvements that it, we will get a out of the box to use your term out of the box methylation status of our plant genomes yeah so importantly our 5mc calling algorithms are geared around cp 5mc in the cpg context um so um um the and that is the the context of methylation which is most common in human genomes when you start to look across other other um, other species in the across across plants and animals and and, and fish etc, um, 5 MC in the CPG context is not always the most common methylation, but in many cases actually we found that 5 MC is a very common methylation for many different organisms. So the answer to your question is sort of um, a little bit tricky in that it, in that I'm going to say it depends. It depends on what the primary and most common uh, context of 5MC methylation is in your in your organism of interest that you're studying. Um, now, in the past, yeah, we, we did say you couldn't do we we couldn't really do 5MC because at base level resolution, and that was mainly because of the problem around the subtlety of the 5MC signature. Um, but that's all been resolved. And we obviously with the with the hi-fi sequencing, we can call 5MC uh, very accurately, but we but our algorithms are geared around that CPG context. Um, so the so in order to answer your question for your particular species, you'd, you'd you might need to find out a little bit more about what is the type of methylation context that's a 5MC methylation context that's occurring in your organism. So we we've got it all. We've got CG, we've got uh, CNG, and we've got CHH. And in fact, yeah. you know, the de novo is actually perhaps well, it depends what you're looking for. So I guess yeah. ma maintenance methylation maybe CGs are sort of okay, yeah. but but de novo CHH is you know of interest to us so what we what we're actually doing is it, CPG was 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 I guess a, a a low hanging fruit I guess if you could if you could call it that for us to develop because um because when you look at the forward strand and the reverse strand the context is the same so we're just looking for those two bases um, and then zooming in on, on on those whenever we see them to look at the kinetic profile and then being able to do uh, and it, and it's all built around um, essentially machine learning and neural networks as to how we do this. It's a probabilistic model based on the kinetic signature that we see. 
but we can expand that to other contexts. So our intention absolutely is in the in the near future is to uh, be able to call um, 5MC in other contexts as we develop those models. So right now it's 5MC in the CPG context and, in, and if that's your major methylation that you're after, great, we can do it. Um, but going forward, we will be looking at other contexts of 5MC, which are going to be relevant for um, other organisms as well. So I think, you know, in answer to your question, yes, 5MC is relevant for um, many organisms now, um, and we only do it in the CPG context right now. But going forward, we'll be expanding our capabilities, which is going to be even more relevant for you. Oh, so hi, James. Um, so this is Kevin. Um, but Dale's got a question online. He's not sure if he can. Is he able to ask a question directly, or do you want me to read it out? Uh, I can. Uh, if it's in the chat, we can probably see. But if he's just emailed, Dale should be able to unmute himself now and talk if he wants. Yeah. Yeah, it's not in the chat. So, Dale, maybe you can. Um... Can we hear you, Dale? No. no, I don't think we can hear him. So, so he's. Um... I think you can hear me now. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, can hear. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I'm particularly interested in the uh, CPG methylation, um, and in particularly low pass sequencing i understood that you're working with the broad institute um you know kind of it's in the genome wide association space i guess where yeah. if we can get dna cpg methylation information and there's been there's a shift towards moving towards low pass sequencing as a replacement to the the snp genotyping arrays i guess yeah. sort of my, where my questions around is um, how low can we go um, still to obtain some useful CPG data? I, I've seen in some of your um, other presentations where you, you talk about some information such as uh, three to five passes, you can get 77% yep. accuracy. Yep. But I know that if, if we're talking about sort of trying to be in the ballpark of cost effectiveness, then we probably need to be even lower coverage of that with SNP genotyping arrays. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, look, we, we've done an analysis of correlation with whole genome, um, and I didn't put the slide in because I wanted to cut out as many slides as possible. Um, we've done a correlation with whole genome bisulfite sequencing in terms of, you know, how do we correlate against that at, at, at low levels of um, coverage. Um, and at, even at five-fold coverage, we have roughly 90% correlation with whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So actually, you know, that's pretty good um, at just five-fold coverage. And you can see from the data that I'm just showing on the screen here that, you know, we're getting base level resolution of, of, of 5MC um, on a single sequence. So depending on, I guess, how accurate, you know, what your, how, I guess, how confident you want to be about the call, um, you know, at the moment we're saying, okay, we, I don't think we've even looked much below five-fold coverage because at five-fold coverage, that's like six human genomes in one Revio cell, which, you know, I don't know if anyone's going to go much below that. But, um, you know, I, we can have a conversation with our bioinformaticians and, and ask the question of, well, how low can you go? Because um, if you start dropping below five-fold coverage, I mean, I can think of things like um, compromising whether you're actually going to hit the region in the genome or not so i mean we can probably we can probably do methylation at just one fold coverage but um you know are you really going to sequence a genome at that lower coverage because just of the the, the stochastics or the you know of the probability of missing a, a region is probably too high so i think five yeah so that, is probably as low that's as the interesting the area in, in that yeah so the the replacement people looking at doing 0.5 or one times um coverage um and then you, you use imputation to get the majority of variants back and and it's particularly people looking at it for some of the the non-european um cohorts as well but yeah the sort of latest information is that you know if you're using say um even two times or four times you, you're still able to get 45 percent of singletons and 95 percent of the common variants so yeah yeah. Yeah. So I look, I, I think that what, 
you know, the same probably applies with five MC. I, I, I mean, we, we're we're looking at it as just another data type, right? Of um, that comes off the system. So I, I think it'd be interesting to sort of talk a little bit more detail about your experimental design and 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 you know what we can actually achieve with that with really low fold pass coverage in terms of methylation calling. But I think I think that um, we're probably pretty well placed to to, to help you with that. Yeah, that, that'd be great because I guess I'm I'm thinking about that when you look at the you know how most of the methylation studies other than the sequencing on large scale they're using the arrays and and yeah. how many how many probes you end up actually getting measurements from um, I I suspect that even at you know coverages of of one x you'd still be ending up getting an, a, a more methylation measurements across the genome so yeah you're going to miss out a lot but you're still going to get a lot, lot more than what the arrays would. Yeah, yeah, got it. And then, as you said, there's there's the potential to impute as well. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, James. This is Roberto Barrero. Um, hey, uh, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. Thank you for today. Um, I have a, a sort of a technical question around the hi-fi reads. Um, you mentioned that it certainly can reach an accuracy that it can outcompete other providers. Yeah. And I was interested uh, to be able to get to that level of accuracy, how many passes do you need um, uh, on your reads? And what are your R&D plans in terms of perhaps uh, increasing the direction towards having longer reads so you can continue to have this accuracy or in a single pass uh, aim to increase the accuracy uh, of the pack bio sequences. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we do we do have a um, empirically determined um, sort of calculation of how many passes are required to get a to to have a certain predicted um, QV, QV accuracy. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head exactly what that metric is, but I think it's something like. Um, uh, between five and eight passes will give you um, between, I think, Q20 to Q30 accuracy. And so the more passes that you have, the more, the more, um, uh, the higher the predicted accuracy of the sequence, you're correct. And for most of our data, we're getting enough passes that it's beyond Q30 uh, predicted accuracy. Um, and so at the moment, we I guess we've settled on a sweet spot, right, of yield of hi-fi data um, versus accuracy and what the trade-offs are for in, in both directions. Um, and so around the 20 KB insert size is, 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 I guess, where we think the sweet spot is and where our customers are, are sort of driving the sweet spot to be, where a 20 KB insert will give you um, a very good yield of hi-fi data, um, many of the sequences out Q40 beyond, um, and um, and in and the length of those 20 KB inserts is enough to give you great um, insights across whatever sort of application that you're doing. Um, interestingly, the um, one of that publication I showed you that came out of the Broad, where they looked at um, and and the recommendation was to do to do long read sequencing on all of their cohorts. Another thing that they actually concluded as well was that read length uh, or accuracy of data is more important than read length. The, the variant calling accuracy um, from accurate hi-fi data was more important than actual read length. So if you have highly accurate sequences, um, you can pretty get pretty well get at most regions of the genome, even regions where there's the, where there's large repeats. We're starting to look at now. Say there's a five kb repeat region where you know a twenty kb read may not traverse it very easily. What we're finding is that those five kb repeats actually have some structure within them, some some polymorphisms morphisms within them, or some some variants that actually allow you to traverse and assemble across those that repeat region. So that's something that's been it's that's actually actively under development at the moment about how we can leverage those the current read lengths of uh, or insert sizes of 20 kb 
to look at uh, regions that are, are really difficult to, to sequence where you may think that you actually need longer reads but uh, to, in order to traverse them, but we're finding that actually the 20KB highly accurate reads are really, really useful for those regions. Um, I think that's a really important point, James, and, and I do see out in the sort of Twitterverse and the like a lot of... of um, of communication where where people are are very um you know pushing very much the the, the longer the read the better um but actually you know, these data that are being published now um, much of that is is actually supporting that accuracy is better and as long as you are over a certain kind of read length as long as it's not a short read but if you've got that accuracy that makes all the difference for your compute and being able to do what you're you're trying to do so i think it's an important yeah. point yeah, yeah. But the other part of the question was, you know, where are we going in the future in terms of our R&D development? Look, I um, I think that you will see, as, as you have over the years, uh, I mean, I, I can't really answer that question because I'm not sure exactly where we're at. But um, what I can tell you is that, yeah, our, our historically, our read links, our insert sizes have increased over time. Um, so I can only imagine that that is going to keep occurring and our chemistries will get slightly better and um, and you'll be able to do larger insert sizes. In fact, we've got some customers that are sequencing like 20, 25 KB insert libraries already and getting actually great hi-fi data. So we're starting to look at that and say, well, wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Um, what can we what can we learn from that? Um, and the other thing to mention also is is like we don't normally make a big song and dance about our um, our, our incremental chemistry improvements and our improvements of our consumables and reagents, um, but just over the last two years, with with I guess what might look to customers of as no real major chemistry uh, uh, releases, um, you can just see from the data and some of the sites that we're working with where. Where they where they track data of over the course of a couple of years, the, the outputs are just increasing, um, just gradually increasing to the point where you know it looks like maybe twenty percent higher output just over the course of a couple of years with with the same uh, chemistry. So I think that that's probably going to drive the ability to make um, longer insert libraries as well. Um. I think some of that chemistry you're talking about is not only on on the instrument itself, James, but um, also some improved chemistry with um, nucleic acid extractions as well to get um, DNA that's uh, in better shape to go into the sequencing as well. So you're improving there too. Oh, it's a, it's a whole range of things. It might yeah. be slight tweaks to the chemistry, uh, tweaks to the sample prep. Um, we've 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 actually put in a lot of improvements that customers don't even really see, which is around the QC, the QC of our consumables um, being test, testing the smart cells before they go out thoroughly, such that we can reduce variability and increase throughput. Uh, all of those things sort of happen behind the scenes and our biggest customers sort of oh, sometimes come back to us and say, hey, have you done something? Have you changed the process or whatever? And we go, hmm, yeah, yeah, we sort of, it's just incremental, incremental improvements are always happening. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so small insects have usually had to undergo whole genome amplification. Have you guys solved issues around the amount of input DNA? Um, yeah, so we, we have a, what's called an ultra low input protocol for um, down to uh, as small as five nanograms of uh, input DNA. Um, and so that, that protocol involves, as you mentioned, whole genome amplification. Um, using a sort of isothermal amplification method using some type of uh, 529 type um, uh, enzyme. Um, and it's actually proven to be quite quite useful. So it's a supported protocol for any genome that is, um, I think the cutoff is 500 megabases. We haven't really, um, so if your genome size is larger than that, it's somewhat untested, but for anything under, the, under 500 megabases, um, it works pretty well. Uh, and in fact, the Sanger Institute, which is doing a lot of the Darwin Tree of Life work, um, they have a lot of samples that are in that category. Um, and they've spent quite a bit of time um, sort of benchmarking and testing different methods. And they've found that actually this whole genome um, amplification followed by library prep and sequencing from, um, from a, a small sample gives you a better genome assembly than trying to grow up lots of insects, for example, and pull them together and get lots of DNA and then sequence that on either ONT or PacBio and try and assemble that um, with all of the problems around 
heterozygosity that's in the population trying to get a clonal population and, and do a genome assembly there's a lot of headaches around that so they've actually found that uh, using five nanograms input from just like the, the the leg of an insect is getting them a really actually reasonable genome assembly using our ultra low input method by just doing genome amplification and sequencing so and that's a supported uh, protocol that we have okay Hi, James. Uh, this is Elena. Uh, I'm a postdoc at QT. So I am uh, interested in working on uh, synthetic chemically modified oligonucleotides and uh, libraries and uh, genes. So my question is a little bit different because I'm uh, struggling with uh, sequencing of very short oligonucleotides, like uh, up to 100 base pair. So, um, uh, do you have some data about occurrence, occurrence of uh, sequencing of these short oligonucleotides? And also, do you need, uh, you mentioned that uh, we can uh, directly ampli uh, sequence and PCR amplicons. Do you need some preparation of, of, of uh, samples? Do you need to incorporate some adapters or overhangs uh, to prepare uh, such uh, for sequencing? And another question is about chemical modifications. Uh, so far, you're talking only about methylation, methylation modification, but there are plenty of uh, non-canonical nucleotides, uh, and epi uh, in particular, epigenetic modification or some synthetic modification. Did you uh, check um, if you can detect different modification, like uh, 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 hydroxymethyl or uh, 8-oxy-G uh, modification or completely different one. Do we have this difference in incorporation of uh, kinetics? Um, yeah, so I'm just sure I might, I might remember all of your questions. So, um... so sorry, first question, do you have any data about uh, 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 sequencing occurrence yeah. on uh, short oligonucleotides up yeah. to 100 okay. nucleotides? Okay, cool. Um, so for the, for the first question, um, small uh, nuclear, small um, oligos, on for our hi-fi sequencing, it is a long read sequencing platform. Um, we so for our long read sequencing platform, the answer is no. Uh, we can't really go below anything any we're, well anything below five hundred base pairs is sort of not really supported. But we've got customers that are going down to two hundred base pairs uh, and generating data. 100 base pairs it's too small it would just be filtered from the analysis and you wouldn't even get any data back um you um i guess there's ways around that if you really wanted to pursue it like concatenating those molecules together and making them larger and then trying to trying to um deconcatenate them afterwards but um i think for that application uh we could probably talk to you about our other platform which actually wasn't even the topic of any of the presentation today which is our onzo short read sequencing platform um, which actually um, may be interesting for you because that platform uh, is developed from the Omniome technology, which is giving you Q40 uh, plus uh, uh, data from short read sequencing, which is, which is, I guess, game changing in itself, right, from the short read sequencing perspective. Um, we're interested in, in things like CTDNA analysis and going for needle in the haystack haystack type applications with that technology because we can really with the act with q40 plus accuracy you can start to detect um, minor um, allele frequencies at really um, really low levels um, so for your getting high accuracy sequencing from short molecules our onzo platform might actually be useful for you um, we can have another separate conversation about that later if you like um, in terms of um, multiplexing and indexes um, there's two strategies prim primarily two strategies either you incorporate an index at the point of amplification of the of what you want to sequence which is relatively straightforward and we have a whole bunch of indexes to do that and we can do dual indexing or or um, what we call um um uh, well essentially dual indexing where we uh, have a, asymmetric right asymmetric uh, barcoding right where we have a, a different index on each side of the molecule uh, it gives us lots of opportunities to do high level multiplexing um the other way to index um, is to use a barcoded smart bell stem loop adapter. Um, so those smart bell adapters, you can actually, uh, we have a set of um, barcoded adapters that actually have indexes incorporated in them. So it depends on what your 
application is, what your strategy is, how your samples are prepped as to which is the best strategy to use for that. Generally for amplicons, incorporating the index during amplification is the best way to go. Um, and for whole genome sequencing, where you're not amplifying your sample, then using barcoded adapters is the way to go for that. Um, the other question you asked was about eight, uh, sorry, um, uh, other uh, methylation contexts uh, or other, sorry, other, other types of modifications. The, sh the short answer to that is yes, but. Um, yes, in that yes, we can detect different types of DNA modifications because they generally have quite different fingerprints in terms of the kinetics that I explained about how we talk, how we actually detect um, modifications. Um, but um, we only we only have a bioinformatics support for 5MC in the in in the way that I described earlier. Um, but we have many customers that are um, oh actually no we have bioinformatics support also for the the common prokaryotic methylations being 6MA and um, uh, and uh, 4 4MA I think the, is the other common one. Um, so that comes out um, just out of our pipelines from our micro microbial sequencing. Um, for other modifications, um, we can we can point you in the direction of other publications where other types of um, bioinformatics pipelines have been developed, uh, which may help you. And I'm, for, for the particular one you mentioned, I'm not I'm not sure whether anyone's done that before. I think it's actually a reasonably common one. I'm pretty sure someone probably has. We can point you to um, other publications where people have taken our data and been able to analyze the kinetics and call those types of modifications. So yeah, you can do it, but it may require a little bit of work on the bioinformatics side um, and may not, may not necessarily be supported by us. Thank you, James. Yep. You got it? Yeah. Do you want to move on, James, or is there any other questions? Uh, hi, James. This is Ling from QUT. I'm a postdoc as Elena. So I am currently work on direct evolution on a monobody library. So uh, we have a synthetic monobody library, which has a very high diversity, like 10 to 13 or 10 to 12. So we are just uh, select uh, something from this library. The size of the library is around 300 to 500 nucleotides. So I'm just wondering is uh, PacBio has some uh, platform to to sequence and, uh, the amplicon, like 300 to 500 nucleotides, and to know the diversity is, yeah. I mean, you mentioned about amplicon sequence and it's very low cost. So I'm just yeah. wondering how, how yeah. it looks like. Compared yeah, I'm, I'm current you've, got it, you've got it in a vector, have you? It's in some type of vector? Uh, it's not in vector, it's a PCR product. It's linear form. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, well, look, that that's approaching the realms of what you can do on the platform. Um, I mean, I can think of lots of different ways that you could actually sequence that. Um, and and the next thing I was going to talk about was transcript um, or transcriptome um, um, transcriptome sequencing. And 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 the reason I mention it is I'm, I'm going to talk about a way to increase the the, the throughput of transcriptome work and and uh, using a concatenation protocol. But I, I think you know 500 nucleotides. Um, it's not currently supported on Revio, but if we concatenated it and join join those join lots of molecules up together, um, or if you had some way to increase the size, uh, look, yeah, I'm pretty sure that you could. You could sequence that on our system in some way if we sort of sit down and talk to you about a strategy for sequencing that library but yeah i mean you've got you said 10 to the 12 that sounds like really quite a lot of diversity within your library um but um yeah it depends on how much sequencing you need i think our platform i mean my first thought is yeah that would be something that we could look at doing with you and work out a way work i, I probably can't answer your question with definitively right now yeah we can do that or no we can't I, th I think we probably can and we just have to work out a way that you might be able to do it and maybe that's not necessarily supported by us um, in terms of a a, a supported workflow um, but we can give you some ideas on how to do it uh, I think it would be quite nice actually if we could make it work 
you get some obviously get highly accurate sequencing uh, data, which would give you some nice data to look at the diversity of your library. James, I have another question. This is Roberto again. Um, and talking now about your radio um, um, system. So um, one of the challenges that we had in the past was to um, integrate the SMRT portal to different uh, compute infrastructure that we have. So I was wondering then, when you design out the Rayview system, how compatible it, it is to integrate to varying infrastructures that might be available uh, across different locations? Yeah, so we, our smart analysis or our, our smart link is the, is, the, is the interface that links into the, into the actual um, sequencing platform as well as your database and then your analysis tools and then smart analysis um, uh, is part of that smart link package which does your um, your downstream um, tertiary analysis um, we we've had multiple iterations of smart link and smart analysis over the years I'm not sure exactly what version QUT is on at the moment and I know that there's been some um, challenges with earlier versions of smart link and smart analysis. So it's hard for me to answer that question. I guess maybe I can answer it in another way in that um, we have not had any real, well, I, I haven't seen any customers more recently having any issues with smart analysis and and, and, and implementing smart link. Um, the, the other thing that we've done uh, more recently as well is is to support and enable cloud analysis. So you can now directly, um, you, you can now do your analysis in the cloud. Um, and we have through SmartLink a way that you can um, upload your data directly to the cloud and run analyses on the cloud. So if, if you're, and I, I'm not familiar, super familiar with QUT's HPC or their infra compute infrastructure or whether that's more recently been upgraded. Um, but we can have a look and see what what capabilities you've got and whether you know whether it's sufficient for our our system. Um, what I can also say is that Revio is producing the same type of data as SQL two e. Um, it's actually in the HiFi data is a much smaller compact file format. The analysis pipelines are actually uh, relatively quick and straightforward compared to some of the older earlier analysis pipelines. So the actual SQL system that QUT has and the type of data that was coming off it is actually a larger file size and more complicated and requiring more resources to anal analyze the data than um, than what would be required with HiFi data. Um, the old CLR format was requiring some pretty hefty bioinformatics to do um, to do the pairwise alignments and an assembly as compared to HiFi, which um, on the actual system, like half of the half of the informatics now is done on the on the actual uh, Revio uh, or the SQL 2E in that the, the, the consensus sequencing um, algorithm, the CCS algorithm, which produces HiFi data is is all done on the Revio or on the SQL 2E system that we've got. And so what you get off the box now is a much more compact BAM file format of uh, highly accurate CCS uh, hi-fi data, which doesn't require nearly as much grunt in terms of downstream analysis as the uh, the old CLR data that we used to produce, which is what you produced off the SQL system at QUT. So, I mean, I, having said all of that, I can only imagine that it's going to be a much um, more streamlined, uh, more pleasant experience for QUT uh, when you're working with hi-fi data as, as opposed to the old data format. Another question related to that cloud option that you mentioned. Um, what is the, the current uh, setup for accessing such a service? Are we looking at a yearly subscription? Uh, keen to have an idea of what will be the associated cost? Uh, for uh, our it, yeah, it, look, I can't, I can't really remember all of the costings involved in that. Um, I'll give you some ballparks. Um, the the to, to do a human genome assembly for example i think uh we costed that out to be about 60 dollars, depending on if you're using peak um uh, whether it's um a spot analysis um capability or on demand or or, or whether it's um because there's, di there's different types of access to aws um and then 
Yeah, so it's, it's actually quite affordable at, at something like $60 to do a human genome assembly. It's pretty, pretty affordable. I think one of the main things you need to think about for AWS is, is storage and downloading the data. Um, and our compact file formats are actually um, better than, say, I guess, if, you, if you're comparing us to, say, for example, ONT, and you're worried about analysis pipelines and how to manage data and what the costs are and doing it on the cloud, then um you know we're significant we're, we're orders of magnitude i think uh more simple than ont you know we, we're producing a off the revio something like a 50 gigabase file that has all of your bam for called um data in it as well as 5m 5mc data in it as, as 50 gigabase compared to something like um you know 1.5 terabases for an ont file that's going to have the same coverage of a human genome it's just their they, their files are insanely large so i think um you know it's quite it's quite um uh it's quite feasible to to set it up and run it on aws uh, and in fact some of the comparisons that one of our customers in australia did suggested that may as well just set it up and on on aws rather than invest in a new compute infrastructure so i, I do think that that is something that people are more and more going towards is the cloud-based compute rather than investing in a whole lot of infrastructure on site because it's actually turning out to be re relatively affordable, especially with our data format, which is pretty easy to handle. Yeah, just just one comment on top of that. I think um, for the, what you mentioned there, James, somebody um, that, that's doing that sort of reasonably locally here um, is uh, that costs were, were yeah, uh, they, they couldn't quite believe actually how, how cheap it was. The only one um, of the services that's a little bit costly is if, if you put something into archive and need to unarchive that and bring it back. Um, you don't want to be doing that too often because that's that's uh, uh, slightly more expensive, but everything else seems to be extremely cost effective. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, James. Uh, another quick question, uh, and this is regarding to end-to-end uh, -end analysis pipelines. Um, you have access to some of those through your smart link. What are the plans in continuing to provide access to this type of uh, capability? Oh, we will continue to do that. Yeah. So, um, you know, we we have. I, I guess. Um, sorry, if I may add to that question. Uh, yeah. whether that would be part of this access into the cloud subscription model that you may have. You have gained access to all this end-to-end -end analytical capability as well. Yeah, so it's up to up to our customers to um, to spin up smart analysis and in the cloud. We can support you with, I think we we probably have an, a, um, an image you can you can use as a starting point. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how it works in terms of implementing smart analysis in AWS or the cloud. Uh, but we we don't we don't charge for that. It's it's up to you to 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 just get an instance um, at AWS, and we provide you all of the all of the smart analysis is free. You just download it from our website, and we've got instructions on how you can implement that on AWS. So you, the transactional side of how much it costs, et cetera, and the subscription is directly done. You know, you do that directly with AWS. We just provide you with all of the pipelines and the smart analysis tools in order to um, to to, to get it, you know, to put it on there. Um, and in terms of, you know, what are we, what are we doing in terms of um, uh, future development of smart analysis? So smart analysis has, um, uh, has pretty much all of the out of the box sort of um, pipelines that you would need for either de novo genome assembly, um, long amplicon analysis, microbial genomes, um, targeted sequencing analysis, um, you know, th there's there's a, there's all of the m major pipelines are, are on there, um, but there's also um, newer things that come in and, and also 5MC, um, I think is there's some 5MC tools in there as well. Um, but things, that, it's a moving target, right? And so there's always new pipelines that come out, we're developing new applications and generally those new applications are um, first come out on GitHub. So for example, our target, uh, our, um, Tandem repeat expansion tool is something that you can get off GitHub. Um, there's, um, uh, what else is on GitHub that I can't, can't recall? Uh, oh, so so uh, Hi-Fi ASM is another tool that's used for genome assembly, which is something that's on GitHub as well. Um, so, so there's a number of tools that are on GitHub that haven't yet been implemented in smart analysis. So what, what do we do as a strategy as a company, right, is we, 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 we look at what 
tools and what pipelines are becoming mature enough and, and embedded enough that we then roll them into smart analysis as a packaged supported solution from our software. Um, and so that generally happens, I guess, a little bit later than some of the new tools that are coming out. So when you're doing sequencing, I mean, as you can appreciate, all the bioinformaticians are all familiar with getting new pipelines off, off GitHub and that type of thing. So we, we have what's called our smart analysis, which is, I guess, mature pipelines that are supported by PacBio as a company. Um, and then we have other, I guess, pipelines that aren't officially supported, but we can help you with them that you can get off GitHub. So you, depending on your application, you may be using a combination of both of those, um, but they're all freely available, open source and, and don't cost anything. And there's no subscription model and we'll help you um, sort of implement them. We'll give you advice to implement um, whatever pipelines are relevant for you. And, and, and as, as we go forward, uh, as I said, new things start to get rolled into um, our smart analysis supported pipeline. For example, HiFi ASM, which is what most people are using for de novo genome assemblies now um, for larger genomes, um, it's proving to be pretty much the, 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 I guess, the leading method is something we, we are developing something similar to that, not exactly the same that we will uh, in the not too distant future implement in our smart analysis pipeline. So that's an example of, you know, okay, we've we've got de novo genome assembly tools within our smart analysis, but I think they're still based on HGAP4 or some other algorithms or IPA. Um, but we we do intend to um, roll in new supported pipelines into smart analysis in the not too distant future. Okay, cool. Um, I'm conscious of time. So um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I've got a few gen questions, but um, I'm just wondering, shall we go ahead with the presentation or? Yeah, just... look, I think it's useful to just touch on um, gene expression, isoform expression, and then and, and then plant um, uh, plant and animal genome sequencing. And then Paul can talk a little bit about Revio. Maybe I'll spend um, five, six, seven minutes talking about this and then hand over to Paul. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so um, getting back to these, this, these, I guess, in terms of fundamental paradigm shifts, another one is in gene expression analysis. Um, and rather than thinking gene expression analysis, thinking isoform expression analysis, and there's a whole heap of publications around that. Um, so short read sequencing, as you can appreciate, you, you don't get uh, full uh, knowledge of all of the isoforms. You can inf start to infer isoforms, but um, it's a bioinformatics sort of guessing game to a certain extent, whereas full length cDNA sequencing is what we uh, we're able to do on our um, on our long read sequencing, and you get unambiguous full length reads, which gives you your uh, full length cDNA. So we the way that we do that is we produce full length cDNA, uh, turn it into a double stranded DNA molecule, and sequence it on the system to produce um, HiFi data. Um, there's a lot of publications out there just showing the value of looking at um, doing uh, full length cDNA sequencing. Um, for example, this breast cancer publication came out earlier last year. 67% of the data was novel isoforms. Just incredible how much stuff is just not uh, really um, uh, not, not known out there about uh, the true diversity of isoforms across lots of different contexts. Um, so, uh, and also with a, a differentiating factor, I guess, with, with HiFi and PacBio being highly accurate, is we're able to variant phase and do haplotypic expression from long read sequencing. This is an example from Maze where they took two different varieties, did a cross, and you can see that you, you can leverage the, the SNVs, the SNPs, within the transcripts to be able to look at um, uh, allele specific expression uh, of, of, of full isoforms. Very, very nice um, uh, uh, use of HiFi. And then also um, uh, th there's a couple of different algorithms to do that. Deep variant is another one. Isophase and deep variant both do a similar type of thing, looking at um, SNVs within transcripts. Um, another area we're super interested in and, and, and driving forward is, is the single cell sequencing space and being and taking uh, full length um, cDNAs from, um, from single cell sequencing uh, experiments and, and, and helping customers look at isoforms within that data. Um, we've developed actually a end-to-end -end solution for this in, con in conjunction with 10X. Um, and one of the cool things that I wanted to uh, touch on here was our MassSeq uh, protocol. Um, and so a cDNA is typically about 1 to 1.5 KB coming off the 10X system. Um, single cell cDNA is usually about 1 KB on average. 
Um, and 1 KB is way less than the 20 KB that we can sequence in, a, um, in an insert of, for um, uh, smart sequencing. So what we've done is we've, um, um, we've um, uh, designed in conjunction with uh, Broad, Broad initially uh, developed this protocol, but we've released it as a commercial solution. Is we've worked out a way to concatenate um, and to programmably concatenate um, cDNA molecules together such that you get 16 of these cDNAs all concatenated together in a, you know, I guess a, in a programmable way, but it could be any cDNA. So we just take the pool, the soup of uh, cDNA and we append tags onto, uh, we split it into 16 different pools, append each pool with different tags and then put it all back into a ligation and to produce a concatenated molecule. Uh, and this protocol works very, very nicely. We get um, really good efficiency with this protocol and then sequence it on our systems. And that instantly gives you 16 fold increase in the throughput of your sequencer because you've, you're sequencing 16 molecules of cDNA in one smart bell as opposed to one. Um, and then that combined with the Revio, the new Revio, which gives you about another order of magnitude of data output um, compared to the SQL 2E. So those two innovations, MassSeq and Revio, gives you about 200 fold increase in the in the amount of transcripts that you can get off a pack bio system than what you could even six months ago. So it's just it's truly extraordinary the throughput increase in terms of transcriptomics that we're able to achieve on pack bio now. Um, so that's going to allow you to do to get nearly the Revio and Masic nearly 500 million full length cDNAs in 24 hours from one experiment. Um, so it's just truly extraordinary what we're going to be able to do with transcriptomics now. And that's why people are now thinking isoform level expression analysis rather than gene level expression analysis. We can get to true quantitative gene expression analysis with this. Um, isn't it just an example? I'll skip over that of a publication that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, I can send that across to you. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and then um, what, what else is coming with MassSeq? So MassSeq, as you can appreciate, this, this, this technique of concatenation can be applied to other things. So we're applying it to 16S that's coming later in uh, later this year. Uh, 16S concatenation to increase throughput of 16S, uh, full length 16S sequencing. Um, and then MassSeq for um, bulk ISIS-6 also coming later this year. Um, uh, and, and in terms of microbiome, uh, microbiomes, I'm not sure if there's a big interest there, but we have really three plays in that space. One is the full link 16S sequencing, allowing you to uh, species and strain level from full link 16S. And the other is shotgun metagenome profiling or shotgun metagenome assembly, um, where you just shotgun sequence like 10 KB fragments or even longer if you can get them from a metagenome sample, which uh, gives you really nice functional uh, profiling. Um, being able to get multiple annotations per read, uh, as well as being able to assemble them. And some, some really incredibly good quality um, metagenome assemblies have been published just in the last six months or so using uh, HiFi data. And Revio is just going to enable that at low cost and high throughput. So, so amazing. Um, and then the last thing is, um, which is which is incredible, is no plant or animal genome is too big or complex to get a high quality reference genome. We've got customers that are doing really complicated stuff with their genome assemblies. Um, one of the and 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 as I, as I mentioned, lots of the con genome sequencing consortia are using HiFi as uh, the primary technology, core technology in their programs. So here's a really cool one, mistletoe, 90 GB genome um, sequenced um, as part of the Darwin Tree of Life project, uh, getting a really nice uh, assembly on this um, 90 GB genome, just in incredible. And there's a blog on the PacBio website if you want to read about that one. Um, a recent collaboration with uh, Jeremy Schmutz from Hudson Alpha, a hexaploid persimmon, um, being able to, to fully resolve uh, six haplotypes, the six haplotypes that are present in this persimmon, just leveraging all of the highly accurate reads to get all of the SNP data. Um, truly, really nice, and 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 Jeremy Schmutz is just going full on hi-fi now. He's got heaps of different stuff that he wants to sequence um, on his genomes, uh, and one and 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 one of those examples is is pan genomes, uh, I guess. Um, and uh, pan genomes are sort of the the talk now about not just sequencing one individual, sequencing multiple individuals. Like if you look at maize, one individual compared to the next is about 60, 70 percent different. Um, so just sequencing one individual from a species. Is probably not representative of the uh, of the genomics of that species. So now we're looking at sequence uh, with the cost coming down, the throughput going up of pack by hi fi, looking at pan genomes, selecting like 20 or 30 individuals and getting an understanding of the variation across the population. 
So we did, recently did a, um, a, a collaboration with Mike Schatz uh, called a pan genome in a day where they took eight nightshade samples um, for Revio smart cells and then produced assemblies uh, across uh, from sample to assemblies in a day. Um, just incredible how fast and, and what you can achieve now with HiFi. Bioinformatics is fast, the sequencing throughput's awesome, and you, know, you can do some pretty incredible uh, uh, work now with, uh, with PacBio. Uh, here's one that's a, a, a Jeremy Schmutz again um, on um, um, so, some some work that he's done on humans, but also um, recently they sequenced uh, sugarcane. Also with um, Karen Aitken from from Syro, one of our Australian uh, scientists, was part of this collaboration, uh, really improving the quality of the sugar sugarcane genome. So some incredible stuff that you can do now with um, with HiFi. So that's all I wanted to show you. I don't think I've got anything else. Um, and now I guess we just open it up or, or we talk about um, uh, if you're interested uh, to deep dive more into what the Revio has to offer in terms of the, the um, technical yeah. side of it. Cool, all right, thank you. Um, so if I could just ask a question about the, obviously if we purchase this system at QT, um, what would the advantage be to researchers here as opposed to kind of outsourcing their kind of sequencing data? Is there anything that we could benefit from by having it in-house rather than like sending off samples? Like, for example, you mentioned that you do collaborations with people to develop new methods and we've talked about things that might need developing. So is that something that would yeah. be possible? Yeah, I, look, I, I always um, think that you, you're going to be able to drive the technology further if you have it in house, um, and if you've got specific strategic projects that you that you're doing, um, then yeah, that I guess uh, a deeper level of engagement with PacBio. And now we have the resources to do that, right? As I mentioned, the collaborations and partnerships that we're forming, uh, we certainly be very interested in talking to you about um, you know what potential projects that you you may have and how we can. Uh, how how we can help with that and how we can partner and collaborate with that. Um, I mean, you can always outsource to a sequencing provider um, if if uh, you know you, if that's your preference and you don't want to you're not in a position to invest. And, and that's certainly one way you could go forward. Just make and you could even make your libraries in house and then outsource them to a sequencing provider. I think. Um, you know, one of the disadvantages there is that, that I've seen, and actually I'm, I'm trying to actively work with sites like yourself to encourage people to actually get capacity themselves, is that sequencing providers don't uh, usually will not offer all of the different applications that you can run, even the supported applications from PacBio. They want to prove them up, run them in house, test them, make sure that they can they can make commitments to customers that are sending samples to them about the performance of those assays, and so they have a certain amount of bandwidth of things that they can get um, get going in-house. Um, so, you know, you may not actually be able to do the types of experiments that you want to do, particularly things that are not supported. So I think having a capability in-house allows you to push the science, push the technology and 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 do things that you, you may struggle to be able to do if you're just purely in an outsource model. So I think the question to, for me would sort of come down to, okay, do you have, a certain number of projects. Um, you may not be able to fill a Revio system, but do you have some projects across the across QUT, whether they be in whole genome sequencing, plant genome sequencing, or transcriptomics, or even um, metagenome genome analysis that would underpin the placement of a system? And if the answer to that is, yeah, look, we could fill a system 20% um, capacity, then you, you're going to get payback on the capital cost um, within probably, a, um, even if you're running a system at 20% 20 capacity, you probably get payback on that on that capital outlay um, in within within two years. I'd, I'd I'd expect probably even less than that. Yeah, I'd say so, so eighteen months happen. probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think um, yeah, if there's if if genomics is a key part of what you want to do at QUT and a key sort of um, space to expand in, and you've got even a modest a number of projects that could utilize Revio, then I think that it makes sense to be thinking about getting one yourself. Um, I've got a question. Uh, my name is Pavel Sadowski. I am research officer uh, at CARF. My expertise is mostly, mostly in proteomics, so I apologize if I ask anything stupid. But um, 
I can understand how, uh, how hi-fi reads improve the quality of the data, especially in the case of transcriptomics data. But I'm just wondering, how, how has it improved the quantitative aspect of transcriptomics data? I know that our SQL uh, that we have at QUT would cost us, it would cost us a fortune to generate a proper quantitative transcriptomics data. How does Revio improve that aspect? Do you have any examples of quantitation from Revio versus quantitation from previous models? Uh, well, we've, we've only just released MathSeq and we've only just released Revio, as you can imagine, and, and the first systems are only just being delivered. So <clears throat> there's probably the the biggest data set is, is the in terms of single cell is the one that I showed in the earlier slide deck, which was actually done on SQL 2E. So it's hard for me to give you an example of, okay, this is this is some quantitative gene expression that's been published on Revio or SQL 2E. Um, but certainly I can try and pull some examples out and show you particularly that single cell, um, <clears throat> single cell experiment that was that was shown earlier. But in terms of the economics, okay, on SQL, you're able to produce about um, on SQL, I think it's 1 million um, um, ZMWs on the system you have at QUT, which would give you about 250 to 300,000 um, full length um, 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 cDNAs, uh, full length non chimeric cDNAs, about 250 to 300,000. And that'll cost you about, um, I think, on the SQL for your consumables and your library, maybe um, $1,500, I think, roughly. I, I can't remember the actual numbers. It might even be more than that. It might be about $2,000, right, for 300,000 um, at most reads off your SQL. So on Revio, we're talking about um, a similar costing, right? So probably about $2,000-ish to for one smart cell. But instead of 300,000 full length non chimeric reads, you're getting uh, with MassSeq close to 80 million full length non chimeric reads. So that's that's just incredible. The like the the uh, the um, the throughput is just it's just insane. It's like what is that? That's about um, that's about a 200 uh, fold increase from just one one smart cell. So that's what's driving the ability to do quantitation. Um, and so your cost per, per, per data point is 200 times less, right, instantly. So it's just incredible. So um, you, you mentioned proteomics and, and you're in the proteomics space. One of our, one of our very, um, I guess, long-term customers is in the prote proteogenomics space. Um, Michelle um, Smith, I think is her last name. Um, She's just built her career around proteogenomics and using long reads, and and she's she's just revolutionising this, revolutionising the space, and and they're going to get a Revio as soon as they possibly can, um, and she's involved in um, trying to improve all of the databases because you can imagine with proteo um, proteomics, you know, you're sequencing lots of peptides, comparing it to a database, and when you, when you dig in and look at what the databases are actually produced around, they're produced around um, uh, data that's that's you know, short read data. It's not full isoforms, and most of the stuff that you're most of the most of the uh, you know the, the the peptides that you might be sequencing don't even match to the database because the databases are just so incomplete. So I think you know being able to produce all of this full length isoform level information and improve databases is just going to be revolutionary for proteo proteogenomics. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, we, we also found out with Kevin that uh, uh, PAC bio data improves proteomics output quite significantly, whereas Illumina data decreases the value of proteomics data, essentially. Uh, I was just wondering regarding this quantitative transcriptomics analysis, um, does SmartLink server uh, support that with the relevant applications? Uh, at the moment, what we have in SmartLink actually is geared around our current supported MassSeq assay for um, 10x genomics, um, single cell genomics. Um, and so what, what it actually does is it allows you to look at, um, uh, it's got all of the sorts of things that you might be, if you've done any 10x single cell, your knee plots for, for cell detection, your mapped reads, your um, um, you, you, can, you can output the data and, and or I think we are not sure if we, um, we support TSNE plot generation, so uh, looking at for, for the different single cell clusters. Uh, 
pretty much all of the type of workflow that you might have done within the 10x supported tools has now been implemented in your smart analysis to support our mass seek assay for 10x genomic single cell um for what you're asking about in terms of quantitation i look i I don't have visibility. I haven't actually asked the question on what we're going to roll into our smart analysis. But as I mentioned, we have um, MassSeq coming for bulk uh, bulk ISOSeq later on this year. So this is um, uh, so. So I can only imagine. Yeah, we, we will have some tools for quantitative analysis. In fact, I think there's already some tools on GitHub for quantitative analysis through. Um, like Squanty is more a, 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 a qualitative analysis, but for quantitative analysis, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's some tools there already, which I could point you to. But in terms of supported tools, I can only imagine that that'll be coming because the throughput that we can achieve with Revio once people start generating data is going to be incredible. Cool. Has anyone else got burning questions that they want to ask? Uh, we've got some lunch if anybody. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So if not, but I mean, I, I've just got one question about maybe one of your competitors. Um, so obviously Oxford Nanopore is developing all the time as well. So I was just wondering if you, so one of the questions I got to ask was what, what distinguishes PacBio from say ONT in terms of what it can offer and um, what it's going to offer in the future. So wonder if you could just comment about that. Well, there's a few things, I guess. The first is the, the, the utility and value of highly accurate long reads is now undisputed. We are the only technology that offer, um, or that, that, that offer, you know, very highly accurate reads, um, uh, in the Q30 plus range, I mean, we, as, as in the chart that I showed you earlier, it's just chalk and cheese, right, in terms of uh, our ability to produce highly accurate reads. So that's a differentiating factor. Um, and the value of that is now becoming very, very clear across m lots of different applications, as as I've showed in, in all of the slide decks. So um, highly just a quick example, James, on I, I know on for example, MassSeq, you, you can set up the MassSeq concatenation. You can sequence that on ONT, for example. And I know 10X Genomics have done that in-house, but they had to throw almost 40% of the data away because the accuracy calls meant that they couldn't map their tags, their indexes properly. So they lost an enormous chunk of the data that they would um, um, get from from using yeah. that bio. So just that's just one example of where the accuracy really counts. And there are multiple examples. The, se the second the second area, I guess, is also in cost. Now that we have Revio, even even with the capex of Revio, um, the throughput that we can achieve and the and the and the cost in the reduction of the sequencing that we're generating is actually costing you less to do pretty much every application. Um, so transcriptomics, now that we can produce 80 million reads just from one smart cell, um, and as Paul said, you, you lose a lot of data from, from, um, from ONT, means that our cost for doing transcriptomics is way less than ONT. Um, ONT are trying to catch up, you know, you, 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 you see um, them producing, um, uh, in, in the whole genome sequencing space, they talk now a lot about duplex reads, and at AGB, AGBT, Duplex Reads was presented by um, Karen Miga, I think her name was, is someone that's been doing a whole human genome sequencing with um, ONT. Um, but even, even, even those reads that they're producing with duplex reads are, are way less per um, flow cell than, um, than what, uh, what PacBio is producing. And when you look at the cost metrics, um, what they did with that experiment is they needed to sequence something like 15 uh, ONT flow cells, and then they cherry picked the the longest reads and down sampled it on a biased way of doing it of producing of, of picking out the um, the longest reads which would represent three flow cells of ONT data, and then they assembled that and they still got an assembly that was not as good as the Pack Bio assembly, and it had five times more errors, and it would have cost about um, approximately three times as as the, the price of what you can do with hi-fi so even even with their, what they're trying to put out with their duplex reads and trying to push on the accuracy front we're way ahead on accuracy 
and we're also way ahead on cost. So from the cost, so accurate read perspective, tick, we, we're absolutely the best. Cost perspective, tick, we're absolutely the best. And the third area that I would, um, I'd, I'd encourage you also to think about is the analysis and the bioinformatics side. Um, so I can relate to you, I guess, a story in, in terms of Genomics England. Genomics England uh, went forward with doing a lot of ONT sequencing for their um, trying to produce, pull, pull that into a, a clinical context. Um, and they found actually now that they've really started doing a lot of sequencing that it's taking, they now have a 60 day backlog of analysis of samples um, from just just a few hundred samples that they're producing all of this ONT data of 1.5 terabyte files for every flow cell, which then needs to be base called, um, bogging down your analysis. And then if you want to do 5MC, you then need to, you need to actually run another uh, algorithm across the data as well to call the 5MC. And then the base calling algorithm might change. And then if you're looking at different species, for example, you need to train the base calling algorithm for every different species that you sequence. And then you have the question marks over, over okay, if you've got a lot of heterogeneity within your species, even within human different ethnic populations, is the base coupling algorithm the right one? Do you need to retrain, retrain your algorithm? So you've got these massive files with, with um, uh, bogging down your, your compute, being having to do all of the base calling and the methylation calling, and then try and do an assembly, which is then going to take you um, uh, probably you know, a, a month or two to do a human genome assembly, depending on your, your compute. Maybe it's less than that. I'm not sure. But um, you know, with PacBio, we're producing hi-fi data, um, don't need to do any base calling on it. It's just one data type with five MC called, small compact file sizes, human genome assembly within two hours. So on the compute side, we just we we just we're just so far ahead. It's 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 just in, in, incredible. So that's the other area that I encourage you to think about as well, which is tends to be um, neglected in terms of what people think about in terms of how they're going to analyze the data and what's the result going to be. So there's, there are three areas, like accurate reads, lower cost, um, much more efficient and uh, friendly compute, giving you, I guess, what you want, which is analyzed data that you can then publish. All right, cool. Uh, so we'll probably have to end it there. Uh, if, you've, mm -hmm. if you want to just close it off, Paul, maybe? If you... Yeah, I mean, I was I was going to run through a little bit of detail about uh, Revio, but I guess the the uh, the stats are, are up there as James is showing, and and uh, you know we're 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 talking as you probably know about uh, the sub thousand dollar genome. That's U.S. pricing, of course. So um, yeah, it's it's going to be obviously a um, you know to get it out here and do everything as, as James said may may be around two thousand dollars for for a genome, but that's a thirty x human genome. Obviously, that's three gig. You know, if you've got one gig genomes, you can multiplex three together for that, or, or you know, you can do your own maths, I guess. And and um, you know, I, even with the the power of Revio, I mean, it doesn't mean that SQL two E is still not a, a very relevant machine in in for certain scenarios. It's it's also a very relevant machine still. Um, uh, but uh, you know that 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 price per base and the throughput and and uh, you know the the the, the power of Revio um, uh, is is um, is is really difficult to overlook and go past right now. So um, yeah, SQL two E of course is still relevant, um, but um, Revio is certainly um, is, is certainly the way forward. I think with with all of this, um, I can go through numbers and stuff if we if we want to um, another time. But basically, Revio is sequencing four smart cells um, at the same time rather than just one. Um, for people who work in the lab, you might be interested that there's no nitrogen that you have to pump into the deck. So it's a, it's a, it's an easier setup and workflow and, and, and things like that. It's like a cartridge system almost with a re reagent. It's much less plastic wear, all of that sort of thing. So they've, they've really thought about it. They've answered the, the two main complaints from customers, which was throughput and cost, and, and the Revio has really blown both of those away now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's the same physical sequencing as on the SQL 2E, so the Hi-Fi sequencing, but it's just doing it at, um, faster and harder and uh, you know 15 times um, more throughput off the Revio. So I am conscious that uh, I think it was Colleen. Somebody put their hand up um, in in the chat. Um, I don't know if you're you're still here, um, Colleen. I'm, I'm happy to take that question if you if you're still here. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, thanks. I just couldn't um, figure out how to unmute myself. Sorry about um, that. I did see it. We just we just didn't yeah. get a breaking conversation. 
Yes. Uh, so what I was going to ask is if you have um, a workflow for your de novo whole genome assembly that um, addresses um, uh, tumors and mm -hmm. And what um, what happens there with in terms of cancer, where you've got a lot of you know translocations, amplifications, um, et cetera. Uh, so basically, a very messed up genome. So oh yeah, yeah, we're super interested in seeing how how far we can push the technology in regards to that. And I think you know with with the highly accurate reads, um, we're going to have a lot of utility in that space. So we we are working with some customers already. Uh, in that area. Um, we don't have, I guess, a pipeline that I could say here, use this. This is something that's working well. Um, it's under active development and there's some considerations um, for that type of context, such as what's the cellularity of the cancer? Um, what's the complexity of the different clones that may be present? Um, and, and there may be different ways that you go about determining uh, how you analyze that. And it also probably have implications in terms of how much coverage do you need as well. So all of those things are actually things that are, we have active collaborations around. And I guess, you know, linking back to Kevin's question, uh, what's the value of getting a system in QUT is that we can start, you know, um, really putting resources into collaborating you with you on that. But it is, it is a super active area that we are um, already working with some customers around that area to solve some of these questions. And, the, and I don't have any examples to share with you right now, um, but yeah, we we think that um, we're going to well, we're already getting some interesting results, and um, we're actually keen to generate more data off even you know, more tricky samples. Um, I guess I can say that we have a we have a um, I think it's announced now. There's a significant uh, a very large project coming out of the APAC region that we're working on um, in collaboration with the customers around this, which I think is involved around about a thousand samples uh, for which, you know, we'll, we'll have a lot more answers about how do you actually go about analyzing a sample like that? Because some of them, some of these samples could be, can be sort of monsters, right? Really complicated. And it obviously looks at, you know, we're, we're genome and transcriptome. So with isoform information, there's going to be a whole other lot, as you were seeing, like two thirds of things novel, not in catalog. And when you start looking at, at um, the heterogeneity of tumors, there's going to be heaps of isoform stuff going on, methylation stuff going on. It's, a, it's, an, it's just ever expanding. And that's why you need the throughput, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so I think I, the transcriptomics is really interesting in cancer because then you can you can start uh, looking at validating some of the things that you might be seeing at the genome level. So yeah, with an experiment like that or a context like that, you might be thinking about okay, sequence the normal sample of that of that individual. So you you've got a a benchmark, sequence the cancer sample, and also sequence the transcriptome, or with long reads, will give you some pretty interesting information. Yeah. I hope that helps, Colleen. I mean, obviously, with the throughput too, you know, de depending from biopsy samples, you know, depending how much cancer and how much normal, you've you've also got that information that um, that's that's there. And how deep you can go when those mixes is is still being established. I think. Yeah, no, that's um, very helpful. And I guess the other thing to keep in mind in the cancer field is that we also use a lot of like uh, patient derived um, xenografts and other xenograft data where you've got mouse and human that uh, you need to be able to work through that um, that uh, that work through. And so, yes, no end of challenges, but great to hear that you've yeah. got um, programs working on it. Yes. No end of opportunities, yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I I imagine bioinformatically that the the xenograph question would be able to be to be addressed. I mean, that's an interesting one. We'd love to, I'd love to uh, talk to you more about that and see see what we can do. But I imagine just from uh, you could um, probably you know bin the reads based on what they line to, and then yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we do with our bolt. Um, short read um, sequencing and um, it, it does yeah. provide you know an awful lot of um, rich data yeah so you can imagine you know having long reads that are accurate it is going to make it more the rest more of the genome accessible as well as um, when you when you're looking at 
tricky um, mutations that might be present in those samples, having long reads is, uh, I can only imagine it's going to be super valuable. Cool. All right. I think we'll have to leave it there. Yeah. Um, thanks again for, for the insights, um, James and, and Paul. And, you know, I'm sure we've got lots of more questions. And if you want to direct them to me, and then I can maybe act as a facilitator for any of that. All right. Absolutely, we're we're here for to to help with any of uh, any of that, and um, yeah, it was just a little bit awkward timing for this week. But I mean, in the fullness of time, we'll definitely try and um, and get on site and and uh, and get sort of face to face on some of this. So um, that's certainly the plan in the in the in the coming months to be on site and see you, so we can discuss more if you wish. Cool. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks Kevin. everyone. Setting Thank up. you, James. You talked a lot, James. So well done. <laughs> uh, all good. No worries. I'm I'm glad to glad to help. I, I love talking about this stuff, as you can as you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks all. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.